Ken and I met uh, back maybe 15 years ago on Lake Superior, um, and uh, as he has a little piece of property up in the paradise up there, and started talking about like deeper learning and and uh, getting into to different realms of, of uh, ways to travel through landscape and, and enjoy landscape, and I was really inspired by Ken's, um, uh, Ken's stories from some of his other travels in the Zane Boat River Valley, which he's presented at this uh, event before. Um, uh, and we started talking about a lot of things on Lake Superior. He helped me publish the paddling guide for that region uh, with uh, the same type of mentality perspective, uh, digging deep into the region. Uh, and last uh, September, we uh, met up for the first time in a few years and started talking about adventures in Patagonia and, and different things. And, and uh, Ken was studying uh, Darwin and the Voyage of the Beagle. He's always been pretty passionate about that. Um, and I read the book when I was out sailing around uh, the coast of South America and different places. And I was working down in Antarctica and had a bit of time off uh, last, this past January. And we're like, hey, let's do a trip in Patagonia somewhere. And we're like, yeah. And this kind of just came together, this idea. Uh, how do I switch slides? I think you're going to have to use it right on the uh, right there. Yeah, that, there's no one. Yeah. All right. So, this uh, this map here is a kind of an interesting illustrated map uh, highlighting uh, this area of South America that's known as Patagonia. Uh, Pata means feet, big people, uh, big feet of the Tulalchi people uh, of the region. And when Magellan went through the 1500s, so there's a lot of powerful history in this uh, and this whole basin here. It just, you have a laser pointer. They don't have anything. So I thought everything was going to be set up here. Uh, this, the route we took, I can't even think up that high, but uh, anyway. Um, we'll be getting an El Chiltan. In El Chiltan, which is up, up there, and then we followed Lago Vidma <coughs> down to uh, Rio La Leona, out of Argentina to the Rio Santa Cruz out to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so that's kind of like the waterway, approximately like 300 something miles, 500 something kilometers. Uh, retracing uh, uh, a very interesting voyage of uh, Fitzroy and Darwin. Uh, and we used uh, these track kayaks, these folding expedition sea kayaks that uh, originally Ken was going to go last year and use a pack raft, uh, but he ended up injuring his knee and got cancelled. So uh, this is my friend Cole, who was working down in Patagonia as well, inviting him together on uh, on the trip, and we kind of tested out the first, the newer model of these boats, uh, the Track 2.0 uh, folding expedition sea kayak for this trip. So yeah, it worked out pretty well. Uh, this is the town of El Chotan, uh going through. Uh, I reached out to a local guy that was a kayak guide in the region and got a whole bunch of information on where to camp and what to do because no, no, uh, North, people from North America hadn't really traveled through the area. Uh, learning about the weather patterns and wind patterns and, and conditions of what, uh, what it's like in the region was a uh, pretty complicated, uh, challenging place to paddle. But while we were playing the trip in El Chaltan, we, uh, we looked at the weather and we had this, this window with uh, very little wind on uh, windfinderwindy.com. You guys are familiar with forecasting and weather systems based off of like pressure systems, precipitation and things like that. They give you a fairly accurate forecast uh, for wind direction and speed. So the route we're going here, this is um, Lago Vidma and uh, the northern ice, or southern ice, Patagonia ice fields down there. And we went uh, off of there, the winds can be really extreme, and this lake is, is, is a pretty intense place to paddle. Nobody really paddles it. They actually camp some boat tours to the Vima Glacier because the conditions are so extreme there. But with this window, we're like, we have a good window to do it. But looking at the lake, it's like gusting 40 knot winds regularly, like pretty full on. Uh, really rough place to paddle. Um, but we had that weather window and had a nice calm uh, way to cross. And we could cross uh, uh, the lake, which was 16.2 kilometers, 10 miles or so, uh, to get across. We had that window. So that morning, <laughs> we got up early and went across. So I think it was January 8th we started the trip. So this is a drawing of. Uh, is Marino, Perito Marino, uh, from 1876, I want to say. Uh, a lot of the landscape of this trip, we retrace old drawings and paintings from the past. And uh, 
this is kind of how the area is dictated of the, the Cerro Torre and Mount Fitzroy range in the southern Patagonia region. This was the view that we got on, on Lago Pima when we were starting our trip. Uh, they almost thought from this painting that there was a, a volcano there, and, 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 and that's the only interpretation they had of the landscape uh, at that time. So we started on the trip, we set up the kayaks, and uh, got moving along and had a great weather window and we, there was squall movement and lots of crazy weather moving across the landscape, as you can see there, like localized, like five, 10 minute intense thunderstorms, wind storms that um, you wanna be careful of avoiding and it's a pretty open landscape. There's not much protection, so you gotta kind of knuckle down when you, uh, you see something coming. <laughs> So we had good weather, amazing backdrop, just spectacular scenery, really mind blowing to be out there and on the way because we thought about this trip for five, six months. And it was going along pretty well. Some massive icebergs off the Pacific glacier that came from um, came from the the southern ice fields. The the Viedma glacier. Viedma glacier, yeah. So I got a good picture of it coming up. Uh, but this is the first day we're kind of following the north shore of the lake around. And uh, this is where we decided to camp because we had such a good forecast with no wind in the forecast, but there was some squalls happening. <laughs> we decided to set up our camp here and it was pretty spectacular. Mm. The views on this mountain range, just like, wow. I think we even got a shot of, a, of the next morning of a climber near the summit. Mm. And you can see with this nice telescopic lens. Uh, and that's Cerro Torre, uh, some of the more famous uh, formations in the Patagonia range. Where we set up camp, just amazing. Because like, no one's really camped here. And we didn't have to worry about anybody on the lake because people just don't paddle the lake. Uh, nobody would. And if you ask for permission, uh, they'd be like, no, you're not allowed. Mm -hmm. um, and so the prefectoras, like the Argentine Navy, it was challenging to get uh, around them and we realized the best way was just uh, to go and claim ignorance if you got caught. Because um, that's how you do it down there. There's nobody down there and to, uh, to, to control and receive. So this is that. There's kind of a squall coming in. <clears throat> I will show you some photos of that in a bit. Uh, but the sunset that night was just spectacular. This is the, this is the next morning. <laughs> Beautiful bluebird day, best conditions you can think of to do that crossing across the lake. Because we knew we, we could get across the lake and the prevailing winds coming from the west. So if we got to the southern shore of the lake, we we're going to be in good shape. But 12, 12, 30, we knew the winds were going to be picking up to 20, 30, 40 knots more. Uh, so at like 7 a.m. Or, or 6 a.m., whenever we were on the water going here, starting this like three hour, three and a half hour crossing approximately. The wind started picking up maybe like 15, 20 knots as we're going across. And we told ourselves, that's the Vima Glacier in the background there uh, with Ken Pavlin. And we decided if the winds picked up and we were in trouble in that situation, we were gonna hook up uh, a three person line tow, uh, like with our 50 foot uh, tow line belts. Uh, so the wind started picking up a little bit. We hooked up to that anyway, just in a line. So we were all together, making sure we're not getting separated and we continued uh, pushing through, which I was a little bit nervous when the wind started picking up because the waves pick up really fast and things can change. And that's exactly what happened as we went to this amazing, magnificent beach that I was like, I'm in heaven because this is like the beaches on the Canadian North Shore of Lake Superior. And I'm just like in heaven because I, I think these are five star beaches, but I did a trip in Baja and I stayed on beaches like this thinking they were five stars. Some guy that wrote a guidebook on Baja rated them as two stars and rated sandy beaches as five stars, but I don't like sand <laughs> though. That's the acronym for my business, <laughs> which is kind of a funny, uh, Predict predicament, but anyway, beautiful spot. V views that many people have never got. Uh, enjoyed lunch there. It was still reasonably calm uh, conditions we had, but we knew it was going to pick up. So we were out here, but like these views are just stunningly spectacular. Bluebird day couldn't have, have uh, better weather really. Uh, we continued along the shore. I think we paddled maybe like 30 miles, 55 kilometers or something that day. It was a pretty long haul. We got to this point here, and I, like Ken was having a hard time with the wind. <laughs> I gave up. <laughs> and, it has um, to be admitted that, that Zach and Cole are expert kayakers. They, uh, I mean, Cole is uh, probably, or Zach is probably one of the most experienced uh, sea kayakers in the world. Actually. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you go that I'm, uh, I consider maybe myself with these boats. And, uh, <laughs> I had uh, 
seas that were starting to run at about three or four feet mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. wind building to 30 to 40 knots on my back. Wow. And I was not comfortable. So I put a shore. And so said, the, the, the choice we made here on the fly, because we knew we had to make ground before the wind picked up and got worse, um, I made the call really quick. I'm like, Ken, you walk the beach. You got a nice beach the whole way. You can enjoy it. I'm going to tow your boat. Cole and I are going to switch off towing the boat. And uh, we just pushed through and rode the waves and surfed the waves for another 20, 30 kilometers or so. And it was, it was incredible. Uh, these boats handle really well, specifically when they're packed. Uh, with a lot of weight, and they ride the waves, and the towed boat held up really well and didn't flip at all, even though it rode waves and almost hit us a few times. That connects a lot with Midwest. So you can actually see uh, that hotel up there. Um, and, uh, we we it meanders around. This has some like class one, class two rapids, so nice smooth uh, rapids that are fun, but the winds. Uh, clock through and we knew this day we had a lot. We had a friend, Nicole, she lived in El Calafate in the town. I worked with her in Antarctica on a cruise ship and I invited her to come for the day because it's kind of like a day trip. It's about 62 kilometers, some kind of miles, I don't know, uh, that we paddled that day with the river and we had over 40 knot winds in the afternoon just cooking us hard. But with these boats being so low profile and weighted so perfectly, we could just ride through this 40 knot winds with the current. And we actually ripped the hole in one of the boats going full speed in a shallow, and we're able to like get out 10 minutes, dry it out, patch it up uh, with some uh, tear aid and aqua seal, and then keep going. Uh, and it's perfectly good, perfectly fine. But they're pretty short sure <coughs> fabric, but when you go in full speed seven, eight knots down a fast flowing river in really shallow conditions, it can uh, really go. But it's just amazing. Once you're on the river, this feeling of being on a river and flowing is Ken's happy place. Mm -hmm. Not on a big wave, uh, lay, uh, lake going down with two, three meter waves. <laughs> um, so happy place. We're having a good time. We had calm morning. Winds picked up. The landscape is just amazing here. We met up with, uh, so Nicole worked for another local kayaking company there called Kayak Santa Cruz. They operate little business, they do day trips on the Rio La Leona, that's half kayaking and half hiking. So it's a really great opportunity to, to see the area and experience it by going on like a little guided tour around. So we actually met up with a guided tour and they were about to do a hike to some, across this amazing landscape, which is like Badlands, South Dakota type, similar area, lots of dinosaur um, bones and, and fossils, which was just amazing. And we went to a site of a dinosaur bone that was recently, oh, this is petrified wood. So you can see like up there, there's the petrified wood going on and this is a uh, up close this is a fossilized oyster so ancient oyster, oyster bed from a, a different time where an ocean covered this whole landscape uh, pre-dinosaurs pre-60 million years 80 million years ago i think was the time period. so yeah we walked out in there and pretty amazing this is a big uh, some kind of brontosaurus bone that's been discovered for less than a year and they just discovered it wandering through there and haven't reported it or anything. It's just a, a big dinosaur bone sitting there where it lied when it, the dinosaur died. And uh, all the sediment erosion has come through the area. And so I'm just thinking about how much is in that area because this area is vast, huge, huge country. And it's all just very remote and hard to get to, but known as the Patagonian steppe, right? So wind's picking up pretty hard. Like it, these photos don't do it justice. Like getting blasted with this wind, and then going with the the current. You're just going into it, and you can paddle like really hard with it to keep your boat straight. And you you're you're struggling the fat to to fight the wind, but the current's pushing you, so you're still making headway. If you were on a lake or an ocean environment without the current, you would you would just be going backwards and and not being able to stay straight, but it was amazing to make headway, even though the wind was so strong. So we made it to a camp, this is like one and few, few and far between where our friend Santiago, who's done the trip a few times, works as a guide in the area, gave us all the inside info. And it was cool, because we reached out to him to get that information, we reached out to everybody we could, connected with the local people, like the local outfitters, and just told them what we were doing and we wanted to know as much about the area as possible because you need it, otherwise you're just camping in exposed places the whole time. It's a nice black stallion that was just roving around our camp. So we were actually windbound here for three days, and this is the thought with Lago Vidma too, because we, we thought Lago Vidma 
we, why wait for five days? We're gonna have 40, 50 knot winds for five days. Let's get a ride and, and, and get going on our trip because we only have so much time to complete it. We skipped 37 kilometers of Lago Viva instead of paddling it, but it was a better choice. We kept going, but we knew we had to wait another three days for the wind to come before Lago Argentino we could do. Instead of skipping that too, we're like, let's wait and do it. Uh, so we waited at this spot, and this is the, the, the Lago Leona, the end of it, and uh, some of the, like when it's high winds up there, you get these crazy clouds that, uh, it's just the landscape's amazing. So this is Lago Vigma, uh, can't see it in that much detail, but there's a lot of wind. Lago uh, Argentino. You can, uh, sorry, sorry, Lago Argentino. This is uh, Lago Argentino coming out of the Rio, Rio La Leona. So we were stuck here, we walked up on this hill and got views, but eventually we got weather. Uh, to get a super flat calm morning to paddle, what is it, six miles, ten miles down the river, or down the river. Um, so it was only like a, a couple hours of paddle, but we got onto the, the Rio Santa Cruz. Um, just spectacular conditions to get through there. So Lago Argentino, this is the lake we kind of paddled across. Uh, that, that part there, I really wish I had a laser pointer. It's all right. Um, we, uh, we went across that coast there, but you can see it's at the end of the lake and the western winds come off the ice fields just at full force. So the winds, you build two, three meter waves, like pretty easy and really dangerous conditions. So you just don't want to go out there. But at the very end, there's this uh, Parito Marino Glacier, which is a famous glacier. So if you go to Patagonia, most people just ignore the route we're going on and they go to this fancy ice stuff because that's uh, more aesthetically pleasing, but the effects of, and this is a, a really unique glacier, it's amazing to see, uh, but this is like where people go and they don't really see the other parts of where they're going. But is this is a, a other in, sorry? Is that a ship? It's yeah, it's a tour ship, so it's a super touristy area. You can do kayak tours there, you can do boat tours, you can walk along the boardwalk system, so this photo of Kento got the boardwalk there. And you can see glaciers calving, pretty amazing. Uh, this is a glacier calving. It's absolutely spectacular. But this is the other side of the lake, right? So, and what's unique about this glacier is that over the winter, it actually like advances, it pushes down uh, and builds a natural ice dam, but then it collapses. So it advances it, but the glacier as a whole is shrinking, but it's actually advancing forward and building up. And uh, Pionce is like, uh, uh, is another glacier in Chile and Chilean side that's doing the same thing on the Pacific, advancing. So it's, it, the ice is, in, it does accumulate over the winter through snowfall and it's still making ice, but it's advancing in a way that it's pushing forward, making this big arch, if you Google it, you can find arch pictures, but usually it's in like the, um, uh, the f like fall time here, so like September, October, after the winter season, as it starts melting, the ice arch forms and, it's, and the water level goes up like, uh, 16, 18 feet in that river, it makes this like natural dam, uh, which is the very only place in the world that happens. So it's a unique thing. This is on the other side of the lake with uh, the damming issue that I'm going to get into eventually. It did, uh, the lake, uh, river and lake uh, levels could rise and completely change uh, this area. But it's an amazing place to see. So Rio Santa Cruz, uh, this is, the, you can see the Fitzroy Way in the background there in El Chilatan that goes across the landscapes. So, and that's what, 100, how long, how far away? Over 100 miles away. Over 100 miles away, it's pretty far away. But just the immensity of this landscape, how far you can see and how far it extends. Rio Santa Cruz is just like from the plane coming in. Uh, we, this, this is the river system just meanders for a huge distance all the way to the ocean. So this natural flow of these glaciers in this lake is, is feeding sediment and nutrients to like fish populations and species, free flowing all the way from the Andes to the Atlantic Ocean. So reach following this, uh, this trail is just amazing to be on this river flowing wide, vast, just as far as you can see, it's unfathomable really if you get pictures and don't do it. And these are Wanakos that are just roaming free wild. Uh, they survive off the, the, the water. And the river is their lifeline and, and uh, the cliffs and, and bird life of these ibises that are living in the cliffs, uh, really unique bird species, and uh, ducks and flora and fauna and, 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 and huge flocks of uh, seabirds that are coming up the river to feed and survive. There's a lot of trout and salmon that come up the river and spawn to, and, and just different migratory birds and kestrels and, and uh, a whole bunch of different bird species. What was this, is a rufus? Or? No, not that, it's a mix of metalark, long-tailed metalark. Long metalark, another unique endemic species of the area. 
uh, the Lenacos, the life and death of the Lenacos, because it's a harsh environment, but these guys just wander in the plains free and really unique, uh, interesting animals, make funny sounds, and, and uh, live wild and free. So this is the only places we can camp because everywhere is just so windy and exposed. So we find these little treated areas where we can actually relax and like, cook a proper meal and enjoy, uh, enjoy camp, the camping life. So this is like a track bag that, that the kayaks fit in. We could roll them up and put them in with all our expedition kit for the whole trip, um, but easily pack it all in together. And uh, successfully we did it most days without having anything on our deck because we didn't like having things on our deck because it just makes a mess. But everything inside, having a clean deck is the way to go. But it's cool because you just move the bags for lots of things. And then we can pack up the boats and take them back after. Because the danger with a lot of people, like the winds are so strong driving back from the east coast across like the roads here, people have lost fiberglass boats and just have them split in half from the power of the winds uh, driving uh, across and into the winds, which is crazy. More beautiful landscapes going down here. This day we almost decided not to go, but because it was so windy, like 40 knot winds. And we were like, oh, the wind's out our back. We're going down the window for the most part. We're manually entering around. We clipped our deck lines together and just kind of directional steered the boat and still moved up, what, eight, nine miles an hour or something crazy. Like, just flowing, you know, just moving. So we could easily do, like, huge distances, 50 miles a day, like, just cruising, right? You know? So that was fun, but it was intense. We just sat there and we were still making headway and not paddling, just taking the wind <laughs> all geared up. Uh, I'm going to step in with a little history here now. Do you uh, want to select it? Because we don't have a little for I don't, so I'm just going to move over here. Okay, I'm going to interfere with it. Well, one of the great uh, appeals to this place for me was, the, uh, was to retrace uh, Darwin's journey uh, on the Beagle. Of course, Charles Darwin, as a young 24-year-old, set sail as a naturalist on board the Beagle with Captain Fitzroy on a five-year around-the-world journey. It was really a trip of a lifetime. Uh, he started as, a, as just an just a amateur naturalist, and by the time he returned, he had <clears throat> begun to put together what eventually would become uh, the evolution of the species and his uh, his theory that's changed everything really since that point. But uh, here you get a sense of some of the uh, uh, trips that he took. While the Beagle would go around the coastal areas of, of not only the Falkland Islands and South America to map the actual coastline, Darwin would be set ashore and would make these long inland excursions. It's often considered that Darwin's theory of evolution emerged from his experience on the Galapagos Islands with the finches and the, and the mockingbirds there. But uh, in the first statement that he makes, the first sentence of his On the Origin of the Species, which was written in 1859, you know, more than 25 years after that Beagle journey, he called back to the memories of those first few uh, years that he spent on the Patagonia or the South American uh, uh, landscape as one of the most crucial things in his formulating his ideas for the theory of evolution. And one of the most interesting things, uh, he was really one of the first one to systematically collect fossils in South America. And what he had found uh, on one of his excursions were these uh, curious plates, which uh, are kind of hexagonal plates that are, were found in the, in the strata. And he said, this is clearly something that is extremely old and extinct. And it looks very similar to the modern day armadillo that is found in South America. And this was a kind of a key that could it possibly be that the link with that old glyptodon, which was 16 million years old, to the modern day could have something to do with a change in species from that, that period. And so the seed was planted. He was very, you know, tentative. Obviously, these were new, this was a whole new frontier. Nobody at this time, people were pretty much convinced of the biblical story of creation and he went with a sea captain, Fitzroy, who was a strict uh, creationist who thought uh, the flood happened 4,000 years or years ago, and, and he had to kind of balance that. He was the actual the, uh, uh, a cabin guest of Fitzroy for this whole period. And you could just imagine the tension that was starting to grow between, between Darwin and Fitzroy. So he would, in his journal, though, he would make these curious notes and you're looking at how species might moved in time and space. And uh, this is one of the key thing, observations that he had made. Uh, 
Well, when they reach the mouth of the Santa Cruz, uh, the, the, the tide at the mouth of the Santa Cruz is second only to the Bay of Fundy up in Nova Scotia. It flows, it, it rises 40 feet every day and descends. So they had taken some damage on the Beagle uh, earlier in the trip, and so they put it up on the side of, on the beach here, let the tide go down, and then they'd make the repairs in the hull. And while they were doing that, uh, uh, Fitzroy and uh, Darwin and about 23 others uh, hauled out three whale boats, and they were going to explore the Rio Santa Cruz. Uh, Magellan had landed here in 1520, and another uh, person had gone up maybe just a short distance farther up the river. But they suspected if they worked hard enough, they would eventually reach the Andes Mountains and find the source of, the, uh, of, of this river. And so they literally started, I went on, just to backtrack a little bit, and the first thing that Darwin Sid saw when he came up on the cliffs here on the side, that they were just packed with extinct uh, fossils of, uh, of uh, oysters. And these great oyster beds were, in fact, we even met some geologists here who were actually working on the very section that Darwin had first drawn back in 1834. And so you can just see these, these oysters here, which are suddenly elevated well up. And this, this it actually was a, an interesting turn in Darwin, and I hadn't really thought about it until actually going down there. But uh, Darwin started theorizing that if these oysters were created in the sea, and now we're sitting so far up on the land, two, 300, 400 feet above, what were the forces that were raising the continent? And uh, so his major purpose in going up the river was to just look at the geology. Why were these, uh, how were the, how were the Andes ra ra raised and, and what was the cir circumstances? And so he was really focused on, on hiking up onto these terraces and, and measuring everything. Uh, just a couple of, uh, uh, Robert Fitzroy, of course, the captain of the Beagle, and Conrad Martins, they brought on an artist uh, into the, on the expedition. They met him in, I think, uh, in Brazil. And he accompanied him around the coast of uh, South America. And this was one of the most exciting things for us because we came down not only with the journals of Fitzroy and Darwin, but also with all the sketches that Conrad Martins had made on that journey. And this was one of the, uh, like I said, this was one of their major uh, journeys into the, into the uh, heart of South America. So it was, it was really an opportunity to, to illustrate for the first time what, what this landscape looked like. And here you can get a sense of uh, the guys man hauling it on the side of the, the shore with the three whale boats. I, I don't know how they did it, frankly. That current is flowing at six to eight knots, and there's hardly any eddies on it. And the wind is fierce coming out of the west there in their face, and the river just can, these continuous meanders. And they worked for three solid weeks working their way up river here. And so what we were trying to do is just relocate uh, some of the sites that, uh, or some of the places that Conrad Martins had sketched. Here is one particular spot in the upper river where they pulled ashore for some lunch, and we did the same. And, uh, yeah, just comparing the landscapes is amazing. Somebody and of course, Darwin not only Darwin had come from a, a, a rich tradition in Britain of, as a hunter and a collector, so he spent a lot of his time not only looking at the geology but also trying to, uh, to hunt the guanaco. And it's kind of curious that all these animals that he describes and the, the, the richness of them, it's exactly the same today, 185 years later. Here, Conrad Martin's uh, the, the condors were real. Prominent. We, we were able to see the condors here, and they're feasting on the dead guanaco along the river. And, and as Zach alluded to, all the animals are just drawn to this artery. I mean, this is the, the Tibetan stem is dry and sere, and this river flowing through it is just an extraordinary uh, uh, riparian environment there. And of course, their goal was to reach the Andes. And, at one point, they got tantalizingly close. They could finally see them rising in the distance. But after three weeks, they were running out of food, and the river even became more torturous at the fault, and uh, they had to turn back. And they literally were within 15 miles or so of discovering Largo, Lago Argentina, the western discovery of Lago Argentina. And even at this time, this area was inhabited by the Tehuelche Indians, the, the original inhabitants. And, 
they would see their fires and, and they had to kind of guard themselves at night not knowing what you know so it was really kind of a, a tremendous wild experience for all these people and you can just get the sense of what, what just a magnificent artery this is flowing through the landscape. And this is the map that Fitzroy drew of the whole trip. And you can finally see where it peters out into this uh, mystery plane and disappointment plane where they had to turn back. And, and literally where the D is in disappointment was, is where Lago Argentina lies today, of course. And that's how close they came. And it was kind of, it was kind of interesting because they'd go up on a hill, but the Lago Argentina lies up on a kind of a plane up above, and there's a bowl below, so they could never really see the lake. And they always assumed that the river would just run all the way another 100 miles, all the way to the foot, and they realized they couldn't reach it. One of the interesting places that we really were looking forward to is a place called Basalt Glen. And this is an area that uh, one of the only little side streams carrying fresh water coming into the, uh, uh, into the river. And we immediately put to shore, and we're, we're greeted by the, this beautiful Patagonian fox here, who came right up to us and was quite curious. And I knew we were on the right track because uh, in Darwin's writings on the Falklands, he had, he had taken considerable uh, interest in these foxes and the evolution of the different uh, species of foxes. And so we started hiking up the, up the valley, and uh, what, what we ran into was extraordinary. This, these are uh, Rhea, uh, which are ostrich-like uh, uh, birds, and it's actually named after Darwin. And it was, it's really curious, and this also played into his whole theory, why don't you go back in, his whole theory of evolution. When he was up on the northern coast of Patagonia, he saw this Rhea, uh, or ostrich, that was quite a, quite a large size, and it was well known at that time. Well, they had Christmas dinner of 1833, just a few months before this expedition to uh, to the Santa Cruz, and uh, Martins had gone out and and hunted and brought back a rhea. And he was, as Darwin was eating the rhea for Christmas dinner, he realized this is a different species. This is not the rhea that I seen up above. So he cleaned off the bones as he was eating them and sent them back to England. And, the, and it actually carries his name, Rhea Darwini, now. And again, this played into to this whole idea that species, you know. Uh, uh, change from both place and time. And uh, he'd already had the sense of the time perspective with the glyptodons and the armadillo. And now here he had it with a living animal op occupying a specific niche in an environment. So we had one final thing to do. One of the most famous drawings to come out of the Beagle expedition was based on this sketch by Martin, Conrad Martin on April 26th. And it became famous as a woodcut and an engraving, and then they took liberties with putting pumas and guanacos and, and all kinds of things. So our goal was to try to locate the exact spot where he drew this picture with Darwin at his, at his side in 1834. And this is what we got. There's the watercolor that he executed, and there's the... And I, I, I facetiously went and uh, dug around in the little caves at the base of this basalt cliff and said, and exclaimed to uh, Zach and Cole, there's a message in a bottle here, Zach. And of course they both, <laughs> but it was, it was like a message sent to us from the past. Here we were uh, 185 years later, absolutely a wonder of abundant wildlife and, and uh, it, it was extraordinary. Are those basalt columns? They are basalt columns, yeah. Hexagonal? Mm -hmm. Volcanic flows were quite common here, hmm. and this is the uh, this is the other aspect of the trip here, and I'll just get into it really briefly. Uh, Barrancas Blancas, or White Cliffs, uh, is this uh, great geologic formation that lines the Rio Santa Cruz in places. Horizontal layers of mud laid down, uh, volcanic ash filling in between, and uh, dating to about 16 million years ago. Uh, of course, unbeknownst to, to Charles Darwin in his day. Um, after the uh, Beagle expedition, about 30 years later, this Argentinian Francisco Moreno took Ceres to go down there and to, to see what, to follow up on it, to see what he could find. And so he ended up going up the river in the very footsteps of Darwin and Fitzroy and, and collecting over 2,000 mammal fossils. And it, when he brought them back to his brother, who uh, was a paleontologist, 
uh, who analyzed them, they found 120 new species of mammal in that formation called the Santa Cruz Formation. Today, it's world renowned as probably the richest uh, concentration of mammal fossils and mammals in, in the world. And uh, this is one of the classic places along the river that Carlos collected at. Uh, uh, so we spent the day just kind of, I mean, you can see the ash layers individual. So this was at a time 16 million years ago before the Andes had even risen. And so you had all those, that moist air sweeping off the Pacific would not have been, you know, swept up by the mountains and then dropped, you know, in a rain, this wouldn't have been a rain shadow. So it was really lush and, you know, forests and, and meandering streams. And uh, so quite a different world. Uh, even at this latitude though, you had almost tropical vegetation. It was during a period in the Miocene that was quite warm, almost like the global warming and change that we see today, but, and you know, it's extreme sense. So in just a matter of a couple hours, just on the surface, we, we found these examples of uh, extraordinary fossils. And, uh, it's glyptodon. And, that, and that, the very thing that first <coughs> interested Darwin, the glyptodon uh, skewed, or the, 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 um, the carapace, was almost the first thing we'd find there. And it was, again, another great connection to it. And here's some artist renditions of some of the animals that existed, this great ground sloth, and of course the glyptodon and the fossils that we found up there. The next is the great Nesodon, which is a uh, like a two-ton, almost hippopotamus-like creature. And uh, again, you got to remember, South America was an island at this time. It was separated from North America, uh, and all these animals speciated in this particular world. And I often thought, you know. The Galapagos became such a center for Darwin's theory of evolution because of its island biogeography. Here was a whole continent of biogeography that, that existed. And, uh, and uh, just as Darwin had imagined uh, the glyptodon, you know, eventually evolving perhaps to the armadillo, this uh, lipotern was, was an animal that suggests the Gonaco that lives there today. So these animals occupying the same place, but kind of had evolved through time. And if one, one of the most interesting things was his, uh, what they call the terror bird. This was a bird that stood 10 feet tall, flightless, and was literally one of the major predators in that particular uh, landscape there. And it was discovered by that Carlos Almaguino right in that formation that we visited. Wild terror, terrorist. <laughs> uh, just as a final aside, there, I'm just going to kind of the, the thought crossed my mind. Here was Darwin, uh, who had discovered these made these major fossil discoveries up in northern Patagonia, walking up this river, and not one time did he mention ever finding a fossil up there. And it just goes to show that even though this he's, this great scientist was so focused, he had shifted his focus from the fossils in the north to the forces that were rising or, or lifting up the landscape in Southern Patagonia. And it was almost as if at that moment, he just concentrated on that. And that right at his feet was a whole world that may have ultimately speeded the a sense of the development of the evolutionary theory had he just paid more attention to, to what was at his feet. So even the, the classic example is you can be prepared, but you, sometimes you get so channeled into a, a certain mindset that you can miss the rest of the world around you. And here, Charles Darwin missed an opportunity to find one of the, the greatest deposits of fossils in uh, probably in the world here. All right, I'm gonna just continue off. Like, that's like a big part of the history of what we're doing and what we did out there. So this is a, a site. Uh, I'm gonna get into some of, the, some of the things that are at stake with this river. So this is a, at a site called Condor Cliff. We hiked up, and uh, Darwin went here uh, on his trip up the river with Fitzroy and discovered uh, a whole bunch of breeding condors up on this cliff, this basalt cliff here. And we were lucky enough to see a couple of them flying around. And the main condor uh, thrive off of this habitat along the river system and the entire ecosystem connected to it. So we did some bird watching. <laughs> Looked like something from Star Wars. <laughs> so. This is uh, uh, a major thing that's happening that is well, well, well underway. 
and it was extremely emotional to go up and see the construction of these two mega dams. Absolutely disgustingly huge, funded by China from a for former presidency of Argentina, accepting and buying all the land in this corridor, all these old Sansia kicking people out, and uh, knowing that that Basalt Glen, uh, the, a lot of these sites and retraced history of, uh, of fossil formations are just going to be completely flooded out by this giant lake system, by this dam that's in, under major construction. You can see it's well underway. Uh, with their building up the layers, and it's going to be absolutely magic, an absolutely multi-billion dollar project. They have a city built in this little, in this little place here, and we paddle right through, uh, and it was extremely emotional, like shedding tears, kind of never really uh, had a, such a strong connection to a place and seeing it being like we were going to be one of the last people paddling through here. And the, the Wanakos are holding their ground, they're just living there amongst this construction site, the Ria is the same thing. They're just moving, they have their families and they're just living there and holding their ground. Like they're so connected and deeply connected to that waterway. And the construction workers from China are just building and uh, just want to develop major infrastructure in all the countries in the world and create energy that isn't, is going to be transported by power lines all the way up to the major cities because of our, our need for energy consumption. And uh, it's just crazy because there's so many different ways uh, there's so much wind here, they can set up windmills, they can set up solar, there's tons of sun. There's so many alternative ways of method of creating, and even in the United States and other places around the world, they're deconstructing dams. Like in the Olymp Olympic Peninsula, I know there was a dam project in Washington, they were like completely dis dis dismantling the dams to kind of get rejuvenate uh, the salmon habitat of the river and, 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 and keep it going, but it's just crazy to see the devastation of, uh, of what dams can do, and it's kind of something of the past and now moving forward, it's just crazy to see this happening. And there's a huge uh, group of people <coughs> trying to stop it, which I'll get into in a minute. But yeah, this is just like all the materials are shipping stuff in, they're building it crazy, like at two different sites on the river, uh, Condor Cliff and La and Costa, so they're kind of putting them together. This is uh, some military guys and some archeologists that are collecting uh, fossil remains, uh, some uh, arrowheads and flint napping rock from the Tuolchi people that once inhabited uh, the area. And all this is just gonna be lost, so they're trying to work us, they're like it's super sad about it and, and tearing up, just thinking about all the history of these people, these nomadic people that lived in these plains that the region Patagonia is named after and like a lot of their roots and heritage and, 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 and lifestyle and ways of living are, are not even discovered and, and it's all just there. But uh, people are just starting to learn and tap into it. And, uh, yeah, so they just traveled and lived in this river, and they didn't even have to dig for it. They're just right there, which is just remarkable. Uh, so yeah, we finished the river. We kept paddling out past these dam sites. Just beautiful, free-flowing river. Amazing landscapes the whole way down. We had some rain and headwinds coming off the Atlantic as we got closer to the ocean. Uh, so had some bad weather. And then this is the bridge at the town of Pier de Buena uh, at the end of our route uh, where we're going out to the ocean. We met up with some local paddlers that have a little business there promoting uh, youth to get on the water and, and have a movement called Patagonia. San Represa, uh, Rio Santa Cruz, San Represa, Rio Santa Cruz, Libra, free the river, uh, free flowing to the ocean. And uh, we paddled with them and kind of heard some of their stories and perspective on the area. And we made it to where we could see the horizon. Uh, the ocean, you know, the town of Porto Santa Cruz on the horizon of the Atlantic Ocean. So go, this is uh, Rio Santa Cruz Libra hasta la mar. So uh, free flowing to the ocean is like a big movement uh, where people are standing up and protesting. Um, uh, and uh, I actually lived and worked in the, in the Aysen region of Chile previous on the Rio Bacar, which is a huge river uh, system, the Rio Bacar and Pascua rivers in Chile were at risk of, uh, of, uh, of being dammed and the people spoke up and, and, luck, and, and, and Douglas Thompson's and Yvonne Chouinard, the founders of Patagonia, happened to have invested interests in land and, and made uh, North America and, and become a powerful nation of Western cultures in the world uh, aware of it and pushed and funded huge projects, conservation projects to make the, the conservation of uh, uh, Patagonica in Chile and, and stop the dams from happening. And until this day, like I worked there in 2011, 
and they were slated to be built in 2013 and never happened uh, because the people stood up and spoke up and rose awareness of this. So there's not many Westerners like us that have been through this area and we're just trying to raise some awareness of it and we have some video and interview footage working with filmmakers in Argentina to hopefully produce a final product of, uh, to just spread more. And there's a big group of about 27 people that came through in kayaks with big signs and, uh, and paddled through and trying to hold up. The, and the real answer is just get as many people as possible. Go, out, go to that damn campsite, just set up camp and don't leave. And, uh, and just like the Rhea uh, and, um, um, and the Winacos are doing. So big movement down there. Another huge uh, thing is seismic activity. So the area of flooding is in the event of an earthquake. It could completely flood out the communities at the ocean side if a dam, if the like dam rupture or power line construction. There's lots of uh, fault activity in this area, so that's a whole separate issue that could just destroy the community. So they're trying to speak up and raise awareness to stop the dam. Uh, yeah. So our final note. Um, yeah, I just want to take you back to the we, actually I, the first night of our expedition. It was. Yeah. Uh, just to I'm leave on a positive note, speaking of, of the highlight of this area, is uh, it's going back to this spot. We were we were rather naive, I think, on that on that first day. We we thought that uh, you could simply uh, uh, paddle out into a nice beach and set up your camp and uh, unload your boats and set up your camp and and uh, that winter weather would be, you know, it would. We were naive, let me just put it that way. Light would break through onto the distant things, and then rainbows would be arching up just beyond us. And, you know, for, as we came to camp, we had this beautiful view, of course, of the Fitzroy Range with Saratori, and, and, and actually, like, in a moment, the whole landscape changed, and you had this kind of symphony of cloud and backlight. And this then was the, the following morning, morning it, it returned calm, and that was the transition in our introduction to Patagonia, and. <laughs> it was it was extraordinary, but uh, yeah, I think we're we, we are. I, I think we're at our window here, but uh, but uh, yeah, thanks guys. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can Google uh, Rio Santa Cruz uh, Libra uh, Patagonia Sin Presas. Find out more about current issues going on. A lot of it's all in Spanish online. I'm posting on so, uh, social media. They have a Facebook page. I'm trying to raise more and more awareness. I'm planning to go back down there next year as well. Connect with people and maintain that relationship to try to have some kind of. Uh, environmental act, act, advocacy and yeah, I don't, I don't want to impose a politics into this whole thing, but this belts and roads program from China and cities, they are going to all countries, southern South America, Africa, Asia, going in with billions of dollars, with guarantees that they get paid back. Well, the countries can't pay them back. So what they, what they're intending to do on a long term basis is to lock up their mineral resources and, and everything. And it's, it's an insidious world. And they, they prey on the weakness of, of, of local politicians who want to make money quick. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I'm, it's just disgusting. And I sat with a conservationist on the plane coming back and, she, and I showed her some of the pictures I had been and she, was, she had been born in Southern Patagonia. And she said, Ken, I've never seen this place. Why don't we know more about this place? And it's, and again, it's just this uh, this uh, ability to go into these areas where, where they were, they don't get much pushback and really orchestrate things. And for, for example, they don't didn't even budget in transmission lines from the dam to the major cities. China had to come back in with more money to guarantee that. And in doing so, they get deeper and deeper into that culture and that world. And at the expense of the Argentinian people who are about to lose one of the great free flowing rivers of South America. Enough said. Well,